Okay, and I'm recording my screen. So, I'm recording class because I've had two classes to practice and things are fresh and I feel okay about it. Um, I have a couple of announcements. The first one is, uh, as of this past Monday, April 5th, everyone uh, Hawaii County has entered phase two of the vaccination availability, which means, dun 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 dun, everyone who is age 16 or older can get the COVID-19 vaccine. And this is super important. This is super important. Um, unless you are like immune suppressed and can't for medical reasons, if, if you, you know, if your immune system doesn't work and you can't get the vaccine, like, unless that's you, you should get the vaccine. Um, now I, I know, I know, okay. So I know, I know of like a couple of conspiracy theories about like, one is that the COVID virus is actually, uh, 5G cell phone towers, like, and electromagnetic radiation from 5G and that, that anyway there are 5G cell phone towers were somehow transmitting a like a virus like uh, and okay so 5G and COVID was one thing the other thing was Bill Gates uh, is putting a microchip in the vaccine for uh, and then step two is kind of hazy step three is profit um, but I think that one came about because like the Gates Foundation had some kind of or one of the charitable foundations uh, from Bill Gates like had something to do with one of the vaccine development efforts. Anyway, if you take those two together and kind of shake them up and blur your eyes and plug your nose and like uh, and plug your ears, then what you can come up with is getting the vaccine will improve your 5G transmission and reception capabilities. Um, so I got the second dose um, the first Saturday of going into spring break. Um, and the, the first dose, the first dose was pretty effortless. The first dose didn't, I didn't have much of a reaction. The second dose was kind of a doozy. Um, and the reason for that is the body mounts an immune response to that second dose. Um, and so like there's this whole inflammatory cascade, your body starts producing B cells in the bone marrow and T cells in the thymus, which is this glandular organ around the heart. Um, you get a fever um, and your bones ache and your muscles ache and your body also releases this uh, signaling molecule that loosens the tight junctions between your cells so that uh, lymphocytes, the, the cells that go around and clean everything up, the immune cells that go around and gobble everything up in, in the lympho uh, lymphatic system, so that those cells, those, those uh, uh, macrophages can go around throughout the whole body and gobble everything up and they can get through these loose and tight junctions. Well, the other thing that happens because of that loosening of the tight junctions is you get fluid edema. Like fluids don't like flow the way that they're supposed to because all the junctions that keep everything compartmentalized are loosened. So you feel kind of swollen and gross. Um, but it's all for a reason. It's all so that the immune system can keep us healthy. And so I had a fever for about a day after that second dose of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Um, and then I was fine. Um, and the other comment that I have here is that vaccination is an essential part of public health and is the only effective way to establish herd immunity. The only effective way to establish herd immunity. So we can become immune to a viral disease by either being exposed to it, recovering, and then having antibodies from being exposed to the virus itself. We can also take a vaccine, 
that the immune system has a response to, and then we produce an immunity to whatever was induced by the vaccine. So this vaccine that we have is based on mRNA technology, which is messenger RNA. Now, messenger RNA is the molecule that cells use to make a copy of a gene in order to, it's like a blueprint for a protein. Um, so like the, the nucleus has the DNA, the DNA gets copied into a transcript, an RNA transcript, an mRNA, messenger RNA transcript that gets exported from the nucleus and then the ribosomes come along and they glom onto the mRNA and they zip along and they make a bunch of proteins. So the vaccine is an mRNA vaccine because the virus, the coronavirus, is an mRNA virus. Its genome consists only of messenger RNA. In the, in the virus, one of the messenger RNAs is, um, is for a protein called reverse transcriptase. It, uh, it lets the virus splice its genetic information back into the cell's uh, nucleus, which makes, uh, which lets it produce a lot more copies of itself than would normally be possible just in, um, how do we know what the formula for soap and olive oil is? Um, we can, we can get to that. We can get to that in a moment. Um, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Um, so the virus has messenger RNA. One of the messenger RNAs tells the cell to put the mRNA back into the nucleus and then like viral transcription happens and the whole thing goes nuts. What the vaccine has is just the mRNA for the protein coat that lets the virus get into the cell in the first place. Okay, so we inject that, it goes into the cells, the cells make those proteins, the immune system comes along, recognizes that, hey, this thing shouldn't be here like they check and they're like is this part and then they're like no it's not so they they gobble it up they make uh they learn to make antibodies for it um the second dose happens the immune system says all right like this is seriously a problem we'll make this a permanent part of the thing um and and that second immune response is what um makes the second dose such a doozy uh, knock me out for a full day um but anyway, herd immunity is when enough people have immune, uh, an immune response or an, a competent immune response to the agent of infection. And that's only achievable through vaccination because every single time a person gets infected, the body makes billions and billions and billions of copies of that virus. Now, um, that's a problem because every time that virus makes a copy of itself or every time the cell makes a copy of the virus, there's a chance that the, the genome doesn't get copied quite accurately. And there's like, you know, some mistakes. Now, humans and higher order animals have a really, really efficient, really effective way of going and checking as the, uh, as the genome gets uh, duplicated when we divide our cells, we're really good at making sure that the, the genes all stay the same from, from one cell copy to the next. And there's a kind of a, uh, there's an, ev an evolutionary pressure to make sure that that happens because if that doesn't happen in a higher order animal, then we end up getting cancer. And then it, you know, if you get cancer, then it's really hard to like keep living and make extra copies of yourself by having kids and you know so but for the virus uh, the virus it may surprise you to find out viruses can't get cancer so they don't really care if uh, if their DNA replication or their their genome replication mechanism is prone to errors so their DNA replication just wants to happen as quickly as possible they don't have time to check for errors 
And so there's a higher mutation rate in these viruses than there is in, say, a human or a cat or a goldfish. And that higher mutation rate leads to the development of new viruses or variant viruses that in some cases may escape the existing immunity within the population. And that's a problem. So what, how do we deal with that problem? Well, we deal with that problem by vaccinating people so that they can't harbor the virus to begin with. And we decrease its possible uh, pool for replication. And we decrease the mutation rate and the evolution of that virus. So vaccination is the only way. So please, please get vaccinated. Um, and that's, that's, my, that's my rant of the day. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. I was wrong about aqua regia in the previous class. It's not sulfuric acid and nitric acid. It is hydrochloric acid and nitric acid. So if you were trying to get away from the Nazis, I apologize if you were captured uh, with your Nobel Prizes. Um, that might have been a different class. All right. Um, exams, lecture notes. My third announcement, my third announcement is you may, I, uh, as, as I may have mentioned, I'm recording the class today. This is because, you know, all right, I've recorded the last three classes. They're here in the lecture notes. I, um, if I record this class, it's, this class might get recorded. Um, I did that because, like, you know, people were sending emails about, I have a good reason for missing class. I'm like, all right, I'll record class. It's not that big a burden for me. I can just kind of throw the class into, into my YouTube channel that I have for DOE. And, like, so I throw, throw it in the YouTube. YouTube processes it. I just include it in the lecture notes. Um, and then you guys can go back and listen to it as you see fit. Um, if you have connectivity issues, like with joining the class or staying on, uh, like online, then like you won't you won't miss anything. Um, and uh, yeah, I figured it was it was a greater potential benefit than it exists the possibility uh, for abuse. Now, that being said you all are still expected to show up and participate in class because here's the thing you can't ask that video a question i mean you can but you'd have to email me it's a whole extra step it's way better to show up to class the other thing is every class is an event and try as i might to recreate each class in its entirety from one to the next to the next and you know it kind of like they improve from one class to the next which is why like this being the last class of the day i've had more practice than the previous two classes so this class should go more smoothly than the first two but stuff happens from time to time no one is immune um but every class is an event and you should be here and be present and participate in that event um, because you're part of it. You're part of it. And if if uh, you know, maybe I'll be recording a different class, and it would be it would be a different class. You wouldn't be able to be a part of that class. I might be interacting with people who you don't know that well. Um, <clears throat> and let's see. For the chemical equation, how do we know what the formula for soap and olive oil is? Here's the soap activity. For the chemical equation, I want you to look at this right here. Free fatty acid and the base, and it goes to soap and water, where X in our case is Na. So we're just going to look at this, just this, this thing at the end here this free fatty acid, the R group doesn't really 
we're going to ignore the all the R group. We're going to ignore the R group. So we can call this HCO2R. R for random chain of fatty acids. That's pretty much what it stands for, random chain. R for arbitrary, even though arbitrary starts with an A. <laughs> R for arbitrary with an A. And what is the base? What is the conjugate acid? What is the acid? What is the conjugate base? Free fatty acid and base. Then we end up with soap and water, as far as I can tell. And yeah, R is going to be an arbitrary chain of fatty acids. So it's not really um, like this thing at the end is called the, the active group, or what, what else is it called? Um, it's a carboxylic acid residue. It's the thing that's doing the reaction. The fatty acid chain is just kind of hanging out. It doesn't get affected by the whole process. Um, it stays the same. So it gets omitted. It gets abbreviated to R. And next up, we have classwork and homework. Oh, we also have the CFA. If you, if you haven't, that might just be people who are still on the roster. Who that might um, that might be an art artifact. All right, let's uh, let's look at this partial neutralization. Partial neutralization. So we're gonna do. I'm just gonna dive right in to guided practice. Oh, we are period six. I'm gonna add a page use the template that I've been using. Templates, math, science, class notes. I'm going to pour myself some coffee because I still have some coffee. It's the best day ever, still having coffee. The third period of the day. Oh. This is going to be called... Ah. It's going to be called something. This is going to be called acid-base neutralization. Formulas and theorems covered today. Uh, this is pretty much just a... It's a limited reactance problem. And um, it's just a limiting reactance problem. We're also going to talk about concentration. And we're also going to talk about pH, because those are ongoing. They should start to be familiar by now. Um, homework. What's our homework? Our homework is uh, this worksheet. What's it called? Part underscore neutral. Part. Part two, underscore, part, wait, underscore, part, underscore, neutral, all right, Cornell notes, um, the Cornell notes, Cornell notes are going to be due next week at the end of the unit. The end of the unit. What does that mean? What does that mean? End of the unit. Um, well, what comes at the end? Of the, we, we give you a test at the end of the unit, which means next week there will be a test. There will be a test at the end of the unit, which is next week. There will be a test. All right. Part underscore neutral Cornell notes. Um, and then this weekend, I might, 
uh, give out an extra, extra credit assignment that's optional. It's going to deal with titration. A little bit, maybe. Maybe. I, have to, I haven't decided. I might not. I haven't decided. I kind of want to, but I still haven't fully conceptualized what that assignment will look like. So, we're going to make some space for notes here. And we'll dive right in. Let's copy this and paste it into our document. Make it larger so that I can read it because uh, boomer status with the bifocals prescription that I refuse to acknowledge so I, I just have single vision glasses which means I make things large on the computer screen or I squint or like try to sit real close but I have one screen that's over here and I have one screen that's right here. Uh, life is difficult. Don't get old. No, do, do get old. Grow old and wise in your age and wisdom. Um, all right. So what have we said? We've said that this is pretty much just a limiting reactance problem. And we, when we were talking about limiting reactants, we had this, we had this way of looking at things where we started by uh, kind of writing a balanced chemical equation and then proceeding from there. So we're going to do the same thing. I want to remind everyone that this right here, big M, stands for moles per liter. Moles per liter. Moles per liter. So we have a volume we have a volume of a concentration of an acid, and we're mixing it with another volume of another concentration of a base. Concentration of acid and concentration of base. How do we know, how do we know which is an acid and which is a base? Any ideas? Remember that, that definition that we were talking about, where an acid will donate H+. Plus. So this is HI, so it has a thing that can donate H+. Plus. And a base is, we have a couple different definitions of a base that both will work. One is that it donates or it releases OH minus, and another is that it will accept H plus. And here's something that will release it OH minus, so that's pretty clearly a base. Um, let's write a balanced molecular formula for a molecular equation for all this, we have HI, hydroiodic acid, and sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and that's going to mainly go in one direction. It's going to mainly go in one direction, so I'm going to make the forward arrow a lot bigger than the backward arrow for our equilibrium arrows. And this is, a, this is a special example of our old friend, the double replacement reaction. So we have two ionic compounds, hydroiodic acid and sodium hydroxide, and they're gonna rearrange uh, in this, if this is A and B and this is C and D, we'll get A and D and uh, C and B. So we'll end up with sodium iodide and H2O. And if my calculations are correct, this is already balanced because all of these compounds are going to be monovalent. So we have like H plus and I minus, and Na plus, and OH minus, and then on this side we have Na plus, and I minus. So those will be our spectator ions if we're talking about an ionic equation. 
and then we have the formation of water. So for our net ionic equation, we, we're worried about the H plus and the OH minus and the H2O. So that's the basis of our neutralization reaction, is just the net ionic equation here. Okay. So what this also says is that these things are in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. So for every mole of hydroiodic acid, we can neutralize one mole of sodium hydroxide. Or the other way, for every mole of sodium hydroxide, we can neutralize one mole of hydroiodic acid. Um, and out of those, uh, out of each mole of each of those, we can form one mole of sodium iodide and one mole of water. So we know our molar ratio of this whole thing. We want to know next what, um, well, what do we want to know? We have a volume of a concentration and we want to find the pH. Now, we want to remember that the pH is the opposite of the power of 10 that we need in order to get the concentration of H plus. So um, that concentration of H plus is going to be in moles of H plus per liter, right? Moles H plus per liter. So we are trying to convert to that thing there. All right. So our first step, well, let's find out how many moles of each of these things we have, shall we? So we have 7.35 liters of 0 0.4 four one one mole per liter H I which gives us liters will cancel gives us some number of moles of HI. We're going to find that. 7.35 times 0.411 is 3.02085. We have three significant figures here, so we'll round that to three significant figures. Three point zero two moles of HI. Next, we have ten point. Two six liters of a different concentration. Sodium hydroxide. Again, liters will cancel. So 10.26 times 0.289 is 2.96514. Two
So uh, we have that number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And we have three significant figures, so we'll round it to the third significant figure. Two, nine. Seven, wait, two point nine seven, yeah. Sodium hydroxide. So for every mole of sodium hydroxide that we um, Sorry, for every mole of hydroiodic acid that we have, we can neutralize one mole of sodium hydroxide. So we're going to find out how many moles of sodium hydroxide we can neutralize. So for every, uh, we, can, we can neutralize one mole of sodium hydroxide for every mole of hydroiodic acid. Moles of hydroiodic acid will cancel. And this will give us the number of moles sodium hydroxide that, uh, that we can neutralize with the hydroiodic acid that we have. And that's 3.02, right? And if we do the same thing, we'll find that um, if we do the same thing for the sodium hydroxide and see how many moles of hydroiodic acid we can neutralize, uh, we'll find that we can neutralize one mole HI for every mole NaOH. What we'll find, the takeaway, is that our sodium hydroxide will run out first. The sodium hydroxide will run out first. So um, we're going to be left with some amount of hydroiodic acid. So we're going to subtract this 2.97 from the 3.02. And we'll find that, um, so we have 2 point, sorry, we have 3.02 moles. Can I help you? What's going on? Hello? What's up? My cat wants to be in the video. Um, what? No? Okay. Sorry, 3.02 moles of hydroiodic acid minus the 2.97 moles that we neutralize. And we're left with 0 0.05 moles. Hydroiodic acid. Are we okay so far? So our pH is the number of mole is the opposite log concentration of uh, H plus. So we, we wanted, so every mole of HI, HI that um, 
dissociates into H plus and I minus. So for every for every mole of HI, we're going to have a mole of H plus. So we're trying to convert to moles of H plus. So this should be how much H plus is in our final solution. So we have 0 0.05 moles H plus in our final solution, in our ending solution, in our, 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 in our final volume of, in our neutralized solution. All right, find the pH of the resulting solution. So we know how many moles we have. We need to now know how much volume we have. So we have 7.35 liters liters plus 10.26 liters. So we'll have 0 0.05 moles of H plus in uh, what is that? 17.61 liters. And now we can calculate the concentration of H plus. 0 0.05 divided by 17.61 is 0. 0.0. .0 Eight. I'll use a big M for moles per liter. And we have only one significant figure at this point, so I'm going to round this to 0 0.03. So then, we want to find our pH. And that's going to be the opposite of the base 10 power, or the opposite of the power 10 that we need to get uh, this concentration, 0 0.03. So I'll plug that into the calculator, 0 0.03. And I get one, one 1.5. Oh. <laughs> I, I've made a mistake. I've made a mistake. This isn't 0 0.03, it's 0 0.003. 0 0.003. Okay. Which is? Two point five two. Which there are special rules for um, special rules for calculating pH. 
round to the same number of decimal places as there were significant figures in the original number. So we will round this to one decimal place. I'm going to include this as a, as a resource in the, in the um, assignment so that you can take a closer look at it at your leisure. So there is one significant figure in the original uh, in this number here. So we're going to round to one decimal place for significant figures. So our pH is 2.5. pH is 2.5. And if we go back and check our so this assignment, we have answers. We found answers. There are answers. I didn't find these. These are someone else's answers. They put 250, but um, I'll say close enough. 2.5. 2.5. Ta-da. So here's a question. Why on earth, why on earth would I go through this big step here of like converting this to find like it was one to one it was one to one but it's not always one to one let's look at an example that's not one to one copy and paste Make this larger. Thirteen point eight liters of four point two eight. Okay, so we have a volume of concentration of sulfuric acid. Oh my, that's a huge volume and a huge concentration. All right, let's, let's write our balanced molecular formula here. So we have sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And we have cesium hydroxide, CSOH. And that's going to go to uh, CS2, CS2, SO4, and H2O. And we'll need two of these and two of these in order to balance our equation. All right. Now, if we look at just the dissociation of H2SO4, we'll see that it becomes uh, 2H plus and SO4 2 minus. That's that one. If we look at the dissociation of cesium hydroxide, we'll see that it becomes CS minus and OH minus, uh, sorry, CS plus and OH minus. CS plus and OH minus. But look, look at this. All right, so, so for every mole of H2SO4, We'll have two moles of H plus. We'll have two moles of H plus. So for so we have two moles of H plus. So like our concentration of H plus. So our concentration of sulfuric acid is four point two eight moles per liter per liter of solution. So our concentration of H plus is going to be twice that because for every mole of sulfuric acid we get two moles of H plus. So our concentration of H plus, concentration of H plus in our starting solution is going to be uh, 
five, six, and this is all just an aside because what does that mean for our pH or our starting solution? A negative log of 8.56, the opposite power of 10 that we need to get 8.56 is negative, not, negative 0.932. Negative 0 0.9352. Sorry, 0 0.932. My goodness, this has a negative pH, this sulfuric acid. And we have 13.8 liters of this stuff. Whew. Who, who, I'm just glad that this is a thought experiment and not an actual experiment because. The, this is kind of this is kind of scary. This is a lot of really really not very nice stuff. Um, all right, but let's find out just how much um, So uh, let's let's uh, Let's let's go so we have 13 point Eight liters times 4.28 moles per liter. Liters will cancel, so we'll end up with moles, and that's H2SO4. And we're going to take that and we're going to convert that so for every mole of H2SO4, we get two moles of H+. We're just going to convert that to H+. We get two moles of H+, for every mole H2SO4. Actually, we want to find out how many moles of cesium hydroxide we can neutralize. We'll stick with the original. Hello? What's up? What are you what are you worried about? You don't want pets, you're just unhappy. Hello. Hello. It's like my cat is trying to warn me about something. I have no idea what. Here's the cat. Here's the cat. She hasn't been spending much much time in the in the box recently. Not living up to her cat box cat reputation. Uh, she's unconsolable. She has food. I don't know what the issue is. So for every. Um, for every mole of H2SO4, we can process, we can neutralize two moles of CSOH. We're doing this to find the limiting reactant. So two moles CSOH for every mole H2SO4. All right. And we'll do the same thing for the cesium hydroxide. Um, 40.1 liters times 2.96 moles per liter CSOH. Let's, let's find what this number is first. And yeah. So thirteen point eight times four point two eight 
is 59.064 times 2 is 118.128. So this is how many moles of CS, CS OH we can neutralize and we'll find out how many moles of cesium hydroxide we have so 40.1 times 2.96 is So our sulfuric acid is going to be limiting Just squeezing extra space in here. Our sulfuric acid is going to be limiting So we're going to subtract these two values to see how many moles of cesium hydroxide we have left over. One eighteen point six nine six. And I know, like, I haven't done the, I haven't, I haven't messed with significant figures at all. Um, we'll worry about that at the end. We'll worry about that at the end. So 118.696 moles of uh, cesium hydroxide minus 118.128. gives us 0 0.568 moles of cesium hydroxide left over. All right. And now, like here we have three significant figures and we uh, we have three significant figures over here and so it kind of like it works out <laughs> it's 0 0.568 moles of cesium hydroxide remain we know from our dissociation uh, equation that um, for every mole of cesium hydroxide, we get one mole of uh, the OH minus. So we have 0.568 moles CSOH for every mole. We get one mole of OH minus for every mole CSOH. 
moles of CSOH will cancel, which means we have, after our reaction is all finished, we have 0 0.568 moles of OH minus. In whatever volume of solution we have, right? So we still need to find the concentration. We're looking for a, we're looking for a concentrate. We're looking for the pH. But we we're, we've gotten to OH minus number of moles of OH minus. Now we'll we'll take that and we'll divide it by that 13.8 uh, plus the 40.1. Divided by 13.8 liters plus 40.1 liters which is uh, sorry 0 0.568 well, OH minus divided by 53.9 liters which is 0 0.01053 3 But the three, like we only have three significant figures here, so we'll round that down to 0 0.0105 moles of OH minus per liter. Okay, we want to find the pH. Now, we know that pH plus pOH is equal to 14. We know that pOH is like, you know, it's like pH only but for OH. It's the opposite power of 10 that we need to get this concentration of OH minus 0 which is 1.97888 following our rules for the thing. pH plus pOH is 14. So we're going to actually our original answer let's round this to three significant figures. 1.98 pH plus pH equals 14 which means pH 
equals 14 minus 1.98. That's a bit scuffed. pH 14 minus 1.98, which is 12.02. 12.02. Oh, is our pH. And we'll check the um, we'll check the answer. And that's the one. 12.02. 12.02. So I'll be honest, when I did this in period two, I got the wrong answer both times. Got the wrong answer both times. Here's how I got the wrong answer. I rounded right here. I rounded. If you round here, you'll get the wrong answer. So if you round here, you get the wrong answer. So I waited to the very end to round, and I got the right answer. Approximately. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Uh, thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, um, send me an email if you have any questions let me know if you can, in the comments if you think this is a good idea and should continue um and uh yeah uh stay tuned for more videos i guess thank you for watching and have a nice day um and yeah that's i'm gonna stop the recording bye